This is a new area, new fund, low prices. They've been driven down. And if somebody has a long-term focus and can accept extreme volatility, like you're gonna get in any kind of new, uh, quickly growing area with lots of potential, well, you gotta accept risk with, with potential. But I think uh, the sky's the limit for investing in new psychedelic treatments. Welcome back. My next guest is Dan Ahrens, Managing Director of Advisor, Sh Advisor Shares Psychedelic ETF. Trades on the NYSE under the symbol PSIL. Dan, welcome back. Glad to be here. Good to talk to you. Yeah, glad to have you. Glad to see you again. Um, so, Dan, the uh, psychedelic sector has been under quite a bit of pressure lately across the board. And uh, obviously, an optimist would suggest that this is an excellent buying opportunity. What is your sort of synopsis of the situation? But yeah, we, we launched our um, Pfizer Share Psychedelics ETF, PSIL, um, which is short for psilocybin, by the way, P-S-I-L, just in the fall. And we launched at $10 a share. It's now under $5 a share. So it's had a serious drawdown. Uh, it's a new fund in a new area. I think it's going to be extremely volatile and investors need to have a, you know, a very long term focus. But do I personally it's a good time to buy in? Absolutely. This is a new area, new fund, low prices. They've been driven down. And if somebody has a long term focus and can accept extreme volatility, like you're going to get in any kind of new a quickly growing area with lots of potential, well, you got to accept risk with, with potential, but I think uh, the sky's the limit for investing in new psychedelic treatments. Sure. Now, uh, in your role as an ETF uh, manager, do you, uh, is there any sort of quality control aspect of this job? <laughs> Uh, I'm not testing the products myself. There's a there's a time and a place for that. It's called college. But right. um, you know, the thing about uh, psychedelics is it's important for investors to know what we're really talking about because uh, people should also know that we manage happens to be the largest cannabis ETF in existence. Our advisor shares pure U.S. cannabis ETF MSOS. It's over a billion dollars. That's also a new, very volatile potential, uh, large potential area to invest in, uh, psychedelics just get off the ground. I point that out because in cannabis, there's a lot going on about federal reform, federal legalization. Is it going to happen? Not going to happen. And a lot's based on, well, there's medical marijuana that's approved in a number of states. It's also approved in Canada. Canada approved adult use cannabis, marijuana, a number of states in the U.S. have as well, and that's where the real money is, adult use. Back to psychedelics. No, we are not talking about adult use shrooms. <laughs> we are talking about biotech, pharmaceutical, real mental health therapies, companies that are listed on NASDAQ in many cases now, even one listed on the uh, NYSE American. And you got to look at these companies like you look at new biotech companies. They might not have any revenues yet. They might have um, drugs or therapies in the FDA pipeline. They might have um, trials happening. And we're talking about these companies intellectual property. And we're talking about, you know, again, what drug therapies they might have in their uh, development pipeline. And, we're talking about micro cap stocks here, just get off the ground. But the important thing is, again, mental health, biotech, pharmaceutical, for PTSD, for traumatic brain injury, for depression, um, new therapies that are gonna be different than all those antidepressants that um, big pharma and, and uh, salespeople flooded the market with. Um, we can also dovetail into talking bad about opioids. Does the world, does the U.S. have an opioid problem, an opioid crisis? Absolutely. K 
can psychedelic treatments help circumvent all of that possibly? Yeah, we need to do all the research. We need to have the development, but that's where that huge opportunity is. Now, um, we're looking at some of your holdings here on the, uh, on the side screen and, um, and, and looking at your symbol, is, is your focus primarily, um, primarily psilocybin or are you also into companies that are experimenting with ketamine, with ayahuasca, with all of these other uh, psychedelics? Uh, yes, all of those things. Now, <laughs> in the ETF space, it's, uh, it's important to get a good ticker. So, um, you know, we felt somewhat smart with what was available, um, getting PSIL for psilocybin. But no, it's not just about psilocybin. Um, most of the tradable public companies that are out there happen to be more in the psilocybin space, but no, there's excellent things happening with, with ketamine, with MDMA, with, with other areas. But that brings me back to an important thing. We're an exchange traded fund, an ETF listed on the New York Stock Exchange. We can only invest in what's listed, publicly traded, liquid enough. And um, in, in this space, it, it's new, quickly developing, very new, but um, we're talking about a number of very low price stocks in many cases, a number of um, you know penny stocks and um, illiquid stocks, and we're investing where we can. I also want to keep this portfolio pure. And what that means is I'm not investing in Pfizer. I'm not investing in Johnson & Johnson. Um, they might be beginning to dabble in the psychedelic realms a little bit. They might acquire psychedelic companies, but can I say those are primarily psychedelic companies? Well, heck no, of course not. I want to invest in companies that are, um, their primary business is developing psychedelic treatments, mental health treatments with psychedelics. Um, I'm looking to keep it pure with companies that are really in the psychedelic space. And of course, not exclusive to, to psilocybin. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious as to your methodology for selecting which stocks you do invest in. I mean, at this point, there are at least 200 publicly traded psychedelics companies that I'm aware of that I sort of keep one eye on. Um, and they, they run the full range from, of course, Compass Pathways, the first and largest, to, uh, you know, sub penny stocks. Um, on the on the gray sheets which are obviously you know not not anywhere near investment grade nor will they ever be so what is your criteria how do you how do you pick the ones that where you deploy your capital well it's a two-part answer right now again i keep using the terms new young quickly developing things like that so my list of investable companies investable stocks is quite limited um, as that's going to continue to grow, and I strongly believe it's going to continue to grow, then I'm going to get more selective on analysis of what is a company's IP pipeline, what are <laughs> what's their balance sheet, what's their revenue growth if they even have revenue growth. But I've already said you got to look at uh, psychedelics companies a lot more like you look at. Um, um, you know, trial or pre-trial biotech companies. They may or may not have something. So right now I am largely limited to what is an investable universe. Now to answer your question additionally, do I have a hard price? No. Do I have a hard, a hard limit on amount of volume? No. Do I have a hard limit on amount of market cap? No. I got to feel my way through that though. Um, you might see some very small investments here to very small companies <laughs> because they're really hard to own more of them. Um, when you get into the top of the portfolio, we're going to name drop here. You already mentioned Compass Pathways. Yeah, I'm going to have Compass Pathways in here because they're pretty much one of the largest and most tradable companies in the psychedelic space. Same with Cybin, same with Atai, same with Field Trip. Um, 
I'm looking to add money to this portfolio, help it grow. And I'm looking at those top, you know, five, 10 companies by where I'm capable of adding at a reasonable entry point, buying and um, filling out a portfolio. So it's not a whole lot more complicated than that at this point. This is only a 10, you know, $10 million fund or so. Um, am I really, really liking Cybin a whole lot more than I like a tie at this point? No, not necessarily. I'm just trying to build out the fund in the top 10 or uh, top five and top 10 holdings. Sure. It's ex- overall exposure to the psychedelic space. But I've proven over and over again that in a space like this, in a space like cannabis, in a space that's um, where a portfolio manager can add value, active management works and it's very important. In a large cap growth fund, it's really, really hard for an active manager to beat the S&P 500. Uh, It's been proven that indexing works. In an area like cannabis, I've proven very easily that active management can outperform an index. I don't want to invest blindly into an index in an area like cannabis. It's too volatile, too new. Sometimes the biggest companies might be the very worst investments. All that's going to carry over into psychedelics. Um, as soon as this area grows a little bit. Sure. Do you um, short stocks at all? No, no. This is uh, as a, um, you know, there are ETFs that do things like that. But for the most part, and, you know, exchange listed ETF on NYSE, it's designed to be long. Sure. It's a, it's a long only exposure uh, type of fund. It's not a hedge fund. It's not a long short fund. Okay. So do you... I know this another ETF in the cannabis space. The CEO made no bones about the fact that he earns revenue, which he distributes to unit holders by lending out shares in the portfolio to those who wish to go short. Is that something that is common among ETFs? Does does your ETF do that? Um, yes, actually, but um, it's nothing nefarious or nothing unusual. It's simply the way that uh, institutional accounts work. And um, individual accounts can work that way. If you simply mark your account at TD Ameritrade or Schwab or Fidelity, um, that uh, uh, um, shares can be lent. Now, it's a very common thing in mutual fund world, in pension world, in ETF world, that it benefits the fund shareholders if the custodian bank In my case, it's Bank of New York Mellon, one of the biggest custody banks in the world. Uh, If they can lend shares to other parties, it creates income back to the fund. Income to the fund benefits the shareholders. It benefits the fund's performance. Sure. Um, I'm going to worry this point a little bit because I can't find an answer to my own satisfaction. But doesn't that create a conflict for you for the success of the tickers in your fund if their, short, their shares are being mailed, available to shorters and it, your unit holders, I mean, yes, they're getting income from the lending of the shares to the shorts, but they're also undermining the ability of those shares to appreciate by having such a inventory available. Is that not a... Nah, it doesn't, it, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's Again, it's Roy Dunn at an institutional level. We simply... Um, you know, sign up for the Bank of New York Mellon Securities Lending Program, which uh, if somebody's not lending share, borrowing shares from us or borrowing from somebody else, we're not. Our fund is not in the business of actually dealing with it. Right. It's all offloaded to a third party agent that lends shares. And it, again, it gives income back to the fund and we're not encouraging shorting. Um, we're not, uh, you know, advertising, Hey, we got shares here. You should come borrow them from us. Cause we're going to, uh, engage in shorting. No, it's really done at a high, high institutional level and, uh, out of our hands and it gives okay. back some, and almost every mutual fund and every ETF in the world does it. Right. Um, okay. Then, so the sector as a whole is, you know, you can sort of look at it as a new biotech company. It's raised a bunch of money to do a bunch of research, to run a bunch of trials, to achieve an FDA approval for some process or and or drug. 
And so is that the primary catalyst that unit holders should be looking to in terms of expectations for what is going to catalyze uh, share price appreciation above and beyond where they might enter the investment? It is. Um, yeah, we have an entire fund made up of, you know, tiny biotechs is what it really is that are almost all, um, you know, pre-trial. Um, so it's going to be very volatile. But yes, you look at these companies, intellectual property, what they have in the um, FDA pr pipeline, what are their therapies? There's gun. It's it's still very early, um, and sometimes we like to say cannabis investing is still in the first inning. Um, well, psychedelics investing was you know they they haven't got on the field yet. It is very very early. But you're looking at their intellectual property. You're looking at their FDA trials what drugs and drug therapies they have in the pipeline and their stories. There's gonna be a lot of shakeout. There's gonna be success stories and failures. And there's gonna be a lot of uh, merger and acquisition activity. Um, so I like a diversified portfolio. It's really hard at this point to tell who the winners and losers are gonna be. And um, that's kind of the benefit of having a diversified fund, if you will. Um, but again, it's really interesting when you get behind some of these companies and get the stories. Um, you know, we've talked to CEOs um, that have been through therapies themselves, life changing, life saving uh, therapies in traumatic brain injury. Um, and again, we're talking about PTSD, traumatic brain injury. Um, depression is, 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 you know, a huge drug market in the United States that I think um, these type of therapies may be able to really be world changing. Obviously, I think there's a great future in this stuff. We're going to leave it there for now. And uh, I'm going to come back and talk to you next about your uh, cannabis ETF, because that's also a sector that's been a longstanding uh, focus of ours. So thanks for your time today. And I really appreciate the insight. Thank you much. We'll talk again. You bet. Bye for now.